Okay, so if you'll take your Bibles and turn with me to James chapter 2 for this message. Uh, I know you may have been expecting Hebrews chapter 9, but I am not ready for Hebrews chapter 9. And so uh, that's, the, that's why I'm in James chapter 2. Uh, we did preach through a lot of James many years ago, uh, back when we actually were doing that first Bible quizzing time. Um, and I don't. I, I was looking back at my notes, and it appears we didn't do the whole book. In any case, uh, this week my wife and I were reading in the book of James, and James two verse one spoke to me very movingly as I read it, and I recalled a message I had preached in 1999. So I decided I would rework that message uh, and uh, impress on your heart the powerful message that we have in our text. The message in 1999 was from James 1, verse 1. This is, this is a corollary, James 2, verse 1. So I'm going to give you that text to start with. James 2, verse 1. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our, Lord, our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. Now the sub subject of this verse is... Uh, not showing partiality. You go through the rest of that section and he'll be talking about don't make it, uh, make, uh, give favor to a rich man, but be generous to all and so forth. Treat each other equally, all of that. We'll talk a little bit about that later on in the message. But there is this designation of our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. And that really struck my, or got my attention our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. That's the title of our message. So I wonder how much you esteem our Lord Jesus Christ. I think most of us here today profess to have faith in Christ. We gather every week to worship Christ. That's what we're here for today. But think about these words. Our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. There's a lot of weight in these words. I hope to impress you with their weight as we go through the message. But I wonder if any of us fully applies them in our own hearts. How much glory does he have in our lives, in our hearts? It is quite easy in our country to be culturally Christian and to live a decent life and even attend church regularly and yet not be too zealous or too fanatical about the Christian life. We can, have, we can have an easy kind of Christianity. And the Bible calls us to complete devotion. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, will, and strength. That's everything. Your whole life should be devoted to our God. And our God is our glorious Lord, Jesus Christ. The man who wrote the words in our, of our text was one whose life was transformed by our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't know a lot about him from the Bible, but we know enough to know that he was a highly esteemed leader in the early church. And that's where James 1.1 1, 1 comes in. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, Greetings. That's how he opens. So James, our subject is James, or our, the person that we're thinking about is James. It was his life that was transformed. And so our message today focuses on the kind of de devotion that produces the faithful description of Christ that James offers us in James 2 verse 1. And that brings me to the proposition. The way you look at Jesus dictates the way you follow him. The way you look at Jesus dictates the way you follow him. So we're going to start with the right view, the view that we find in our text of James 2 verse 1. So our text in context, I guess I, there's a little spot here. I didn't, uh, I, I mentioned this and I thought I was going to put this on the screen, but I didn't put it on the screen for you. So I'm going to just read it. If you've got your Bible open, I hope you do. Uh, read along with me. 
Uh, the first four verses we're just going to read. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down by my footstool, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? So he's talking about showing partiality. And this, this discussion goes all the way down to verse 13, this subject, partiality. And uh, the, the designation of Christ in verse 1 is not the main point of the text. Nevertheless, the way you view Christ influences the way you treat others. If we're thinking about partiality, if you think of our, our glorious Lord, Jesus Christ, if that is the focus of your life, partiality goes out the window. That's really what I want to, that is the conclusion we want to draw from its placement in, these, in this passage, where it is in its context. But let's understand what this means. I want to give you a couple of literal renderings of chapter 2, verse 1. The first comes from Young's literal translation. He says, My brethren, hold not in respect of persons the faith of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's a fairly literal translation. The New American, which we are reading, says, Your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. It's sort of smoothing things out a little bit for us in the New American. I'll give you the Greek word order. This is a very wooden uh, translation. The faith of the Lord of us, Jesus Christ of the glory. That's how the Greek works. Okay, And you say, well, how in the world? Well, you smooth it out. Your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. The New American, that's, that smooths it out. It's smoothed out a bit in the, even in the Young's literal translation. But notice how this construction, the faith of the Lord of us, Jesus Christ, of the glory. All right? So, what does all this mean? First of all, Jesus Christ is the person we worship. Here, this phrase or this term is used basically as his name. Now, his proper name is Jesus or Yeshua in the Hebrew or Joshua. We anglicize it to Joshua. Christ or Christos means Anointed. It's the exact equivalent of the Hebrew word Mashiach, Messiah. So you could call this literally Jesus the Anointed or Jesus the Messiah. But in the church, it becomes a name. We talk about Jesus Christ. It's his name. This is the person that we worship. He's the focus of our worship. All right, so Jesus Christ is the person we worship. But then we have this other designation. The Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is Lord. We, we can use this as a kind of name, Lord Jesus Christ, as well. We'll say that uh, in various ways when we refer to our Lord. We use it as a name. But it has a meaning. Here, it's the Lord of us, Jesus Christ. Okay, notice how that literal... So that if you put a comma there, that might help you. The Lord of us, comma, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ tells us who the Lord of us is. And so this word Lord, the primary meaning relates to the possession of power or authority. That's what Lord means, power or authority. Someone with power over authority. So thus, one who has power over another, or uh, literally an owner as in a slave owner, a lord, all right? Someone who owns, has authority over somebody else. It's not the use here. It's not viewing the Lord that way, even though James himself calls himself a bondservant of Jesus Christ. We'll talk about that a little bit later. That's not what it's really referring to here. Or somebody who is in a position of authority, a master, a supervisor, a, uh, a someone who has vested in him power. Now, he does have vested power in, in his position, our Lord Jesus Christ. He certainly does. But that's not really what he's talking about here. 
It also means this. One who possesses divine majesty, the Lord of heaven. And that's what it means here. The Lord of heaven. The Lord of us, Jesus Christ. This is a statement. This statement is used sometimes of God himself, this designation. Of men acting for God, they're called lords in the Psalms. Or of Jesus Christ. And the use of the word Lord raises Jesus above the human level. When we talk about our Lord Jesus Christ, we're not just talking about another man. Uh, we're not talking about a man whom we're the fan of. We are, uh, most of us are Canadians and most of us are somewhat interested in hockey. And we've just completed the Stanley Cup playoffs. And the wrong team won, of course. And hopefully you're all agreement with that. But, you know, we look at these men who play this game and they are, we, we can become a fan. Like maybe we're, the star player is our favorite player, or maybe it's somebody who's maybe not the star, but he's a special person on the team, and that's our favorite, and we're a fan of that man, but he's not our Lord. Okay. We don't treat Jesus like that. He is our God. He is our God. So we mean to say, and James means to say, Jesus is this Lord, this God whom we serve. And notice this, he is the Lord of us. He is the Lord of us. Our Lord, it's described in the New American, but the Lord of us. James himself submits to Jesus Christ as Lord and God. Think about Thomas in his confession, which he says in John chapter 20. Remember, Jesus appears, this is eight days after the resurrection, the second Sunday after the resurrection. And then he said to Thomas, reach here with your hand, or your finger and see my hands. Reach here with your hand and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Okay, so here, Thomas confesses his faith in his Lord and his God. And all who believe in him, if he's ours, if you would say, yes, he's mine, if I'm one of those people who identifies as a Christian, I'm born again, I put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I then am saying, I submit to him as God. He is my God. And then he's called, in our text, the glorious one. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. And you, I guess I should have had that literal one still there. The faith of the Lord of Jesus Christ. Of the glory is the way it's put out, set up in the Greek. So, Jesus Christ. The glory. The glory becomes a restatement of his name. It's the technical, you want a grammar lesson, it's apposition. Okay, you state something and then you rename it with another word. Apposition. Okay, Jesus Christ, the glory. He means not just glory, but the glorious one. And in the New American, we, we translate it the glorious Lord Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, the word for dwelling place is connected to Shekinah. In fact, Shekinah means dwelling. Okay? The Shekinah appeared in the luminous cloud that descended on the tabernacle. When they came to dedicate the tabernacle, the, the glory of God descended. The lum, this luminous cloud, the, the intensity of the presence of God, God uh, in the midst of his people came and rested on the tabernacle and the people were unable to remain uh, even in the building and in, in the structure, they had to wait outside until God lifted his presence from that place. It was so intense of an experience. The same thing happened when Solomon dedicated the temple many, many years later in Jerusalem. All right, the Shekinah. 
The Shekinah is the visible manifestation of God dwelling with men. Leviticus 26 says, Moreover, I will make my Shekinah among you, my dwelling among you, and my soul will not reject you. So there's this promise. For those who will be faithful to God in the Old Testament, the glory, the Shekinah, will dwell with you, he says. It's very interesting to go back all the way to the end of the Bible then, to Revelation chapter 21, verse 3, and he says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God, the dwelling of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. In fact, we're told in, the, in that time there will be no need of a sun because the glory of God will lighten everything around. And then we have this verse. At the beginning of this age, John 1.14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, the glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. At the beginning of this age, at the beginning of the church age, God tabernacled among men. So James attributes this glory, the Shekinah glory, to our Lord Jesus Christ. This glory defines him. All right, so we've got this phrase, our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. That's how James is designating him. We're going to come back to this in a moment. So, but let's now talk about James. And in doing that, we're going to talk about the human view of Jesus Christ. The human view. So James is the author of this epistle, as we've noted. But which James? All right. There is, he's identified in chapter 1, verse 1, we looked at that, James, a bondservant of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. He writes as if, when he writes and he says, James, everybody knows which James he's talking about. It's not like this is an uh, a unusual name. There are four different Jameses mentioned in the New Testament. Uh, one commentator says, few persons with the name of James could succeed in identifying themselves merely by their first name. The writer must have been an important James. Okay, so we could, you can think about people like that in our world today. You know them by their first name, certain ones. They, just one name. Oh, I know who you're talking about. There's lots of other people with that name, but if you use that one name, that is the person that you know who we're talking about. Now I'll refrain from hockey illustrations. I can think of several that I could say the name and you know who I'm talking about. Okay? But we'll refrain from that. All right, James. So there's four in the New Testament. The first is James, the father of Judas, not Iscariot. He's mentioned in Luke 6.16 and Acts 1.13. But he's just the father of one of these disciples. Um... Judas, not Iscariot. The other Judas, right? He's very obscure. We only have him listed a couple of times in the Bible. Nobody knows him other than that. They don't know anything about him. He had his son. We don't know much about his son either. He's one of the apostles. That's all we know. Okay? So it's not him. Then there's James, the son of Alphaeus. He's mentioned in Mark, Matthew 10, verse 3, and Acts 1.13 as well. He's also too obscure. We don't know anything about him. The third one is James, the brother of John, one of the sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder. Now, he is a likely candidate. He's one of the apostles. He's actually one of the leading apostles. He's the brother of the very famous John, but he died before this epistle was written. Slight problem. He didn't write from the grave. All right, it's not him. So who does that leave us with? It leaves us with James, who was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And he was also one of the brothers of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to the flesh. He's the only other James left among the New Testament names. His position in the church of Jerusalem allows him to simply identify himself as James and then carry on. And everybody knows 
We are talking about James of Jerusalem. That's who we're talking about. We know who he is. All right, so James is the brother of Jesus. He's growing up in Jesus' shadow. So consider this statement in Matthew uh, 13, 55. Is not this the carpenter's son, referring to Jesus? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers James and Joseph and Simeon and Judas? So there are those brothers. Jesus was born first, of course. He was Mary's firstborn son. Then came James. He's the next oldest. We don't know how much older Jesus was than James, but he came along sometime after Jesus. And notice, there's also, notice, I want you to notice Judas as well, because we have James and Jude in the New Testament, two books in the New Testament. And this Jude is the brother of James, and he is the one who wrote that other book. So these two men are in the New Testament as authors as well. This home was a working class home, not peasants. Okay, They weren't just serfs working in the fields. Their father was an artisan, a carpenter. But he's not wealthy either. He's a laboring man. He's I mean, I don't know, they didn't really have a middle class, but he's not, he is a, he's a working man. Not rich and not absolutely poor either. We see him with his brothers in company with Jesus at the wedding of Cana. So here's that verse, John 2.12, After this he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there a few days. So James was there when Jesus died performed that first miracle at the wedding at Cana. And he maybe heard his mother give those words to Jesus and sort of be working behind the scenes in that particular situation. Jesus changes the water into wine, and James would have been privy to some of that which went on in that particular occasion. Now, consider, however, the relationship of between James and Judas, uh, Jesus. There's no record, but I want you to consider, first of all, this one reference we have about the childhood of Jesus. This is after the temple, where Jesus was left behind in the temple. It says, He went down with them and came to Nazareth, and he continued in subjection to them, and his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And then it says about this, And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. And we often talk about that. This is the only reference we have to Jesus' childhood, this little vignette. And it's, the story is he got left behind in the temple. Now, Jesus would be about 12, we think. Would the other boys have been with them? Would the care of those little ones have been a reason why Jesus was overlooked? Because Jesus always did the right thing. You knew he would be with you. You knew he, he would know when you're supposed to be leaving. You would know that he would, he would always do the right thing. And they came to the end of the day and couldn't find him. And so they start retracing their steps. Where could he be? Like he never does anything wrong. He never. And there he is in the temple talking to the priests and the scribes. And they're like, didn't you know? And you know the story. All right, so... How would you like to be the brother of someone who never did anything wrong? Now, there are brothers. Okay, I've, I have a brother. And my brother would probably say he thinks he never does anything wrong. And he's wrong because I'm the one. Isn't that the way we are? That's the way we are. Okay, We all think we're the one that never does anything wrong. And they're, it's always their fault. It's the other person. Think about James. So Jesus was in subjection to his parents. He continually increased in wisdom and stature and favor. But here's James. You know, do you think James ever required correction in his days? Now, I don't think, I just can't imagine, Mary would say, how come you can't be like your brother Jesus? Now, I'm sh <laughs> the temptation would be there as a parent. But the fact is, she would know there's something different about Jesus. And I doubt she was putting those kind of guilt trips on him. How about you? Would you, if you had Jesus as your brother, would you have always loved him? I mean, 
you couldn't ever do anything wrong and him know about it. Because what would he do? He'd report you. It's the right thing to do. Okay? I mean, it would be tough being a brother of Jesus. So would he, would he have always loved Jesus? Would he have always uh, had a good relationship with him? As a boy growing up, I can see there would be some possibility, potential for resentment. But later on, when Jesus was in his public ministry, we have this story. Then his mother and his brethren, brethren arrived, and standing outside, they sent word to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. Now, the understanding we have of this passage is that they were concerned about the, the pressure that Jesus was putting himself into with all these crowds and all of this activity, and they were worried about him. All right? Answering them, he said, Who are my mother and my brothers? Looking about at those who were sitting around him, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers, his disciples. For whoever does the will of God, he is my mother and sis, uh, my brother and sister and mother. Now, do you think James learned about those words? How would you feel if that was you? You're here out of family concern, and what does he say? <laughs> I don't need them. Now, he wouldn't say it that way. He's not saying it that way. I'm just ad-libbing, right? But he points out that those who are doing the Father's will, the will of God, this is my brother and my sister and my mother. And how would you react as a brother to that, that kind of statement? That would really be hard to take in some ways. So little wonder. Now this is near the beginning of the Lord's ministry when things were really getting difficult and busy. Now John 7 to, uh, verses 2 through 5 gives us another story. Here we go. Now the feast of the Jews, the feast of booths, was near. Therefore his brothers said to him, Leave here and go into Judea, so that your disciples may also may see your works, which you are doing. For no one ever do does anything in secret when he himself seeks to be known publicly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. And then notice this comment from John. For not even his brothers were believing in him. This is six months before the crucifixion. Not even his brothers were believing in him. Verse 5 contrasts with the attitude of the disciples from the beginning of Jesus' ministry at the wedding in Cana. Here's this testimony of John. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. But contrast that with his brothers. For not even his brothers, after three years of miracle after miracle after miracle, some of which they had seen, not even his brothers were believing him. So James knew about Jesus, but he didn't view Jesus as more than a man at this point. His always perfect, now slightly mad, older brother. He knew Jesus as a person. He knew about Jesus' many mighty works, but he did not know Jesus as the Son of God like the disciples did. And I called this point the human view of Jesus Christ. Many people in our world know about Jesus. If you come to this church for any time and listen to the preaching here, you will learn about Jesus. But until you realize you're a sinner, that you cannot save yourself, that you must call on this man, Jesus Christ, to save you from your sins, and then you do call, until you call, you do not know him as our glorious Lord, Jesus Christ. That's the human view of Jesus Christ. There are a lot of people who think about him, they'll think, if they think about him at all, they think of him as a historical figure. 
or a figure of myth. At best, a mere man, and that's all. Is that where you are? The human view of Jesus Christ. Point number three, the transformed view of Jesus Christ. We find that James was in the company of the apostles on the day of Pentecost. I'm going to read, and this is from the upper room uh, description, John, Acts chapter 1, verses 12 to 14. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. When they had entered the city, they went up to that upper room where they were staying. That is, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, there he is, Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James, that other James, that other obscure James. These all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer and with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So in that room with the disciples, on that day of Pentecost, his brothers, James, Simon, I forget the other guy, what was the other guy? Jude is the last one, I'm trying to remember. Oh boy, oh well, that's a sign of age. Okay, they're all there. Now, in John chapter 12, they were not believing in him. In Acts chapter 1, they're there in the upper room as his disciples. So, what happens? Well, let's talk more about James before we get to what happens. James became the leader of the church in Jerusalem. When Peter was in prison in Acts chapter 12, he was in Herod's prison and he escaped, here's the words that he told the, the Christians he went to. Motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he de described to them how the Lord had led him out of the prison and he said, report these things to James and the brethren. Okay, so he goes to where he knows this prayer meeting is, report these things to James and the brethren. Who's James? The brother of Jesus, the leader of the church in Jerusalem. That's who he is. All right, when the Jerusalem council occurs, James is the acknowledged leader of the church. Acts chapter 15, verse 13. They had stopped speaking. James answered, saying, Brethren, listen to me. Now, I'm not going to read all of this passage in Acts 15, but if you read it, James is the spokesman. In fact, James is the person who becomes uh, the one who proposes the solution for the Gentile problem. Here's the Gentile problem. What are we going to do, us Jewish believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, now that we have Gentiles coming into the church? What are we going to do with them? And James says, all right, here's what we're going to do. And he gives the reason. You can read that whole chapter. It's a marvelous chapter in God's Word, Acts chapter 15. We see Paul reporting to him at various times, and it is in fact his conversation with James that leads him to take the vow that puts him in the temple when Paul is going to be arrested uh, sometime later in Acts chapter 20 something, 6 or 24, maybe 24, I can't remember exactly. And we have James as the, now the author of this epistle, a very recognizable person. James a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad. Greetings. The date of the epistle is usually con considered to be about A.D. 45, one year after the death of James, the brother of John. He writes to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, that is, the Jewish Christians who are scattered from Jerusalem. That one of the reasons they were scattered is because when, of the persecution of Stephen, where Stephen was stoned to death. And then later, the fury of the Apostle Paul before he was a Christian. Right? And so he scattered, the church scattered because of his activities. And James writes to provide Christian instruction to the many scattered abroad dispersed from the main church, the center of teaching. So what we see in James' life is a dramatic change. The contrast between a knowledgeable skeptic. So he knows, he knows more about Jesus than anybody else in the world probably. But he didn't believe in him. Right? But now he's the leader of the church in Jerusalem. There is a change in life and thought and deed. So how did this happen? Now, before the crucifixion, James was not believing in him. We, the implications of the John's gospel is that none of the brothers were at the foot of the cross. Mary was there. And God says to 
or that Jesus says to Mary, woman, behold your son. He entrusts his mother to John's care, not to his brothers who were not there. Yet after the resurrection, James becomes a leader in the church. So what changed? 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is talking about the resurrection. I delivered to you the first importance, but I also received that Jesus, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain al alive Remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James. Then to all the apostles. He paid a personal visit to James. After his death. What was James thinking? He was there in Jerusalem for that Passover. He heard his brother was arrested. I knew he was going to get into trouble. I mean, we tried to stop him. We knew things were going bad for him. I can't believe it. I'm not going to go there. After the resurrection, he's hearing wild stories. Those people, they're nuts. And Jesus appears to him, and all we know about it is what's said here. Jesus wouldn't have had to say anything. James' heart changed in a moment, I believe. And so now we have him saying these words in his epistle. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. A bondservant. He doesn't identify himself as the brother of Jesus. You know, I'm somebody, right? <laughs> a slave. Of Jesus Christ. That's what that means. And then in our text, he describes Jesus. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. What does James call us to do in his epistle? He tells us in chapter 1 to practice true religion. In this passage, he calls us to refrain from partiality. He calls us later on in that chapter to prove our faith by our works. He tells us in chapter 3 to get our tongue in subjection. How many of us have that one down? How many of us show our glorious Lord Jesus Christ in our lives by our tongue. He calls us in the latter part of James chapter 3 to exhibit the wisdom that is from above, which is first peaceable and gentle. So that's what James calls us to do because he is, because our Lord is our Lord Jesus Christ. The way you look at Jesus dictates the way you follow him. Are you satisfied with the way you're following Jesus? But even more important, is Jesus satisfied with the way you're following him? Remember, he is our Lord, our glorious Lord, Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for our glorious Lord, Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that if there's anybody here today who does not know you as Savior, that they would bow their proud hearts, that they would submit, they would receive the faith of Jesus Christ. They would believe in him and live for him. Lord, for all of us, we've come so short so many times. Help us, Lord, to serve you with our whole hearts. We pray these things in Jesus' name.